Module 3, Climate Action Challenges Posed by Policy Integration and Options to Support Integration. In this third and last module, we will address climate action, DRR challenges, and policy integration challenges, such as coordination and coherence, the availability of data and information, and access to support. We'll also provide various options on how to effectively address each challenge, including the role of NAPs. Module 3 will also provide recommendations for future work. The climate emergency is the biggest economic, social, and environmental threat facing the planet and humanity. Climate-related disasters have almost doubled compared to the previous 20 years. This has exacerbated inequalities within and between countries, with those contributing the least to global emissions often experiencing the worst impacts of the climate emergency. We are at a crossroads. Climate change is undermining the ability to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Climate change is rewriting the global resource map for assets such as water, arable land, and energy, while driving migration, displacement, and instability. Transitioning to a sustainable net-zero carbon world requires rapid systems-level changes, including in key sectors such as energy, food, and health. Collective action, political leadership, and financing are needed to keep the global average temperatures within the 1.5 degrees safer limit outlined in the Paris Agreement. However, prudent risk management requires preparation for a range of negative outcomes associated with varying degrees of warming. It needs to effectively manage unexpected concurrent threats, such as the current COVID-19 crisis. Here are some of the main challenges. One, current mitigation trajectories are leading to unmanageable disaster risk. Climate change increases the frequency and intensity of hazards, the exposure and vulnerability of communities and individuals, and the stress on water and food security. The world is now potentially on track for a temperature increase of three degrees or higher. Current mitigation efforts are insufficient. A continued increase in carbon emissions will result in irreversible changes, including the probability of breaching thresholds for tipping point impacts, such as ecosystem collapse. Two, investment in risk-informed adaptation is lagging. Risk-blind planning can, and in some cases already has, created new risks and resulted in maladaptation. There needs to be a radical scale-up in adaptation measures and a comprehensive approach to risk analysis and management covering a full range of hazards. Current risk analytics are inadequate to enable effective, preventative, and anticipatory action to reduce the humanitarian impacts of climate-related disasters. Three, action to manage long-term impacts and residual risks is inadequate. The impacts of the climate crisis, such as a sea level rise or ocean acidification, are growing global challenges that aren't adequately addressed in current development planning. This failure to account for risk has hindered planning and consequently underestimated the costs and benefits of rapid climate action. The continuing increase in the number of extreme weather events and the likely impact on population displacement, loss of livelihoods, and access to health and other basic services will be overwhelming. Four, investment and financial systems are not fit for the purpose. Financial systems need to better quantify how well their assets will retain their value in this era of climate change. Undervaluing climate risk is a particular concern for longer term investors and sectors, including insurance, pension funds, infrastructure, and agriculture. Five, climate change and disasters are reinforcing inequalities. Climate change, vulnerability, and inequality interact in a vicious cycle. Disadvantaged groups suffer disproportionately from the adverse effects of climate change. This diminishes their ability to reduce their exposure, avert potential effects, and cope and recover from climate and disaster impacts, resulting in even greater inequalities. Now we will look at policy recommendations. One, galvanize political leadership and momentum. Government policies, plans, and programs must be designed to operate under a range of risk scenarios. Governments need to upgrade climate and disaster risk analytics to better account for systematic risks, knock-on impacts, and the medium to long-term effects of various climate scenarios. Cost-benefit analyses must integrate the real projected costs of future disaster impacts. The disaster risk reduction community has decades of experience in managing extreme events and reducing risk related to potential climate-related disasters. Their experience needs to be harnessed for planning and the scaling up of adaptation actions. Two, scale up a comprehensive disaster and climate risk management. Comprehensive disaster and climate risk management are central to development planning, 
including in energy, industrial, land, ecological, and urban systems. Risk-centered approaches should be integrated into NAPs. Adaptation and climate information must be into national and local disaster risk reduction strategies. Three, empower communities and mobilize society to ensure no one is left behind. Gendered roles, responsibilities, access to resources and decision-making power mean that women and men contribute differently to the causes of climate change. They are affected differently by it and react differently to its impacts. Integrating a gender analysis in the development and implementation of climate change and disaster risk management policies, strategies, and programs is essential to prevent the expansion of inequalities driven by climate change. Four, invest in sustainable, resilient infrastructure systems. Infrastructure assets should be prioritized, planned, designed, built, and operated to account for climate changes and potential disasters. Services provided through infrastructure systems like energy, water, and health should also factor in potential climate and disaster-related disruptions. Massive investments are needed to build low-carbon infrastructure. Scaling up nature-based solutions, achieving land degradation neutrality, restoring the oceans, halting biodiversity loss, and prioritizing sustainable ecosystem management are critical for success. Five, promote innovative investments and financing mechanisms. In order to support mitigation and risk-informed adaptation action, governments and non-state stakeholders should fulfill pledges for an equitable division of climate finance. Financing instruments and layered financing mechanisms should be scaled up to enhance preventative and anticipatory actions. By building partnerships with the private sector, actors can co-develop innovative financial instruments. This includes managing residual risk through bonds, insurance products, and other contingent financing mechanisms. Incentives and regulatory mechanisms can be used to drive action and investment pathways for a transition to low-carbon, resilient economies. Six, ensure behavioral change through science, evidence, and effective communication. Plans and policies can be better informed with strengthened scientific knowledge and evidence. Communication with and within communities should be enhanced to act as an effective bridge between knowledge and behavior. Communities should have easy access to information on climate risks, associated impacts, and the cost of inaction to better appreciate the impact of their actions. All risk information, including early warning, should be impact-based to improve understanding and trigger action. Now, we'll discuss and address the types of challenges faced when seeking an integrated approach to adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. These include coordination and coherence, the availability of data information, access to support. In addition to highlighting these challenges, we'll explore options to effectively address each, including the role of NAPs. One, coordination and coherence. State and non-state actors across multiple sectors and scales, whether local or global, can facilitate policy coherence and integrated approaches to adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Implementing changes through multiple institutional frameworks can prove challenging. In the case of projects funded through international climate finance, even coordinating activities subnationally or within a single ministry may be problematic. Implementing partners, financiers, and planners may have different ideas for project implementation. Despite these challenges, many parties have successfully coordinated the complex set of involving local actors in adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. For example, reference number two, case study number one, examples of a local actor involvement in recovery policy frameworks from Japan and Indonesia. Non-state actors may have a unique ability to undertake coordination efforts. For example, Partners for Resilience, an alliance of civil society organizations led by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, supports integrated risk management in 14 disaster-prone countries at the community level as well as policy planning by local, regional, and national governments. IFRC has a long history of working with organizations and people in vulnerable countries. Successful projects of Partners for Resilience have impacted over half a million people across nine countries to date. Projects include the installation of reservoirs for drinking water, diversification of livelihoods in drought-susceptible areas, and reforestation of unstable slopes. Another feature of the program's success is the capacity built over many years. 
This example illustrates the important role of civil society in supporting national governments in the planning and implementation of integrated risk management, serving common objectives of the UNFCCC, the SDGs, and the Sendai framework. Public-private partnerships are also important tools in coordinating activities among actors. Working closely with private actors may remove some of the institutional barriers associated with government-coordinated action and allow well-resourced companies and investors to apply their capabilities to activities that result in both profit and public benefit. Two, availability of data and information. Timely and reliable data is essential in making informed decisions and coordinated action for effective disaster and climate change risk reduction, response, and recovery. Data on a wide variety of indicators relevant to the three post-2015 agendas are simply unavailable in many areas of the world, especially data that relate to socioeconomic conditions and other facets of well-being. There needs to be an improvement in the amount and quality of information being collected across a range of indicators, especially higher resolution information about the impacts of climate change and the risks that climate change poses to societies. Several parties are developing information platforms to address this issue. Japan, for instance, is in the process of designing a database for tailored adaptation and disaster risk reduction solutions that will include information on the whole Asia-Pacific region. Climate model projections and other data are most useful when they are successfully communicated to policymakers and other users. As such, another priority is the development of climate services and related information in a form that can be easily accessed and digested by non-scientists. It is important to work with stakeholders to train individuals to better utilize climate information. Planning and adaptive management can be employed in order to make progress on the three post-2015 agendas urgently while allowing space to change course as better information becomes available. Three, access to support. Financial resources and technical support are necessary to plan, implement, maintain, and evaluate activities that advance adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Developing country parties need assistance in their pursuit of these agendas. Some mechanisms have been put in place to provide funding and begin filling the financing gaps of developing countries, while new and innovative ideas continue to emerge. The GCF, for example, seeks to fund projects that encourage paradigm-shifting change and has worked towards the aim of a 50-50 balance between mitigation and adaptation finance. The Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery has expressed an interest in providing funding and technical assistance for climate resilience projects as well as other disaster risk reduction work that will also directly contribute to adaptation and sustainable development. In this way, integrated approaches to pursuing the three global agendas broaden the pool of resources available to interested countries. An integrated approach will allow countries to undertake actions that contribute to all agendas simultaneously, while accessing a greater diversity of resources than may have been possible previously. Countries are not limited to relying on external funding and can leverage both public and private sector investments to serve multiple agendas. For instance, investments in development or infrastructure may also support adaptation and or disaster risk reduction, and public finance can be used to de-risk a project to encourage private sector investments. Countries can also look to reform and tailor domestic financing mechanisms, such as credit provision, subsidies, and tax allocation, to capitalize on existing capacities. Four, national adaptation plans as an option to support the implementation of integrated policy approaches. Given the challenges of developing collaboration and coherence, and of accessing support, the process to formulate and implement NAPs could play an important role in the development of collaboration and coherence. The process of formulating an NAP may also help to identify gaps and needs that could be addressed in order to enhance action on adaptation, including through international cooperation. NAPs can increase awareness of the business opportunities associated with adaptation. NAPs could enable linkages between national and subnational development processes by encouraging subnational governments to undertake vulnerability assessments and by providing clear guidance through a legal framework of what different levels of government and ministries or agencies should do. The NAP process also opens new avenues for financial and technical support to pursue policy integration. The GCF supports the formulation of NAPs and will provide developing countries 
with up to $3 million U.S. dollars for this purpose. This funding can be used to build technical capacity within countries and to begin establishing the institutional frameworks for success. Overall, the NAP process provides an important option to support the development of integrated approaches, due in part to its demonstrated success as a planning instrument, the resources available for its support, and its iterative nature and flexible nationally driven format, NAPs may be an integral part of supporting national development planning and may work to integrate the essence and targets of each post-2015 agenda in a meaningful way. Five, options to support integrated policy approaches. To summarize, several challenges exist to developing an integrated approach to adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. There are several options to overcome these challenges and support further integration, including through the process to formulate and implement NAPs. There are many opportunities to enhance adaptation action prior to 2020 by pursuing integrated approaches to adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. The common themes of resilience and ecosystems can serve as core concepts around which integrated planning can be organized. While the common scopes of the three agendas provide space to improve coordination and coherence among all relevant actors. Additionally, the overarching objective of adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction to benefit vulnerable people and communities can aid in identifying highly effective adaptation actions that contribute to all three sets of goals simultaneously. However, there are still challenges in the pursuit of greater policy integration and enhanced adaptation action including the unprecedented levels of coordination required, the need for more and higher resolution data, and the ability to access financial and technical support. Both state and non-state actors have made strides towards overcoming these challenges and continued progress on these issues will support the achievement of all three global agendas, including enhanced adaptation action. Strategies to mobilize resources for the implementation of the post-2015 agendas are particularly important it is integral to ensure that adequate, sustainable support is available to assist developing countries in their adaptation efforts. Opportunities need to be maximized to strengthen resilience, reduce vulnerability, and enhance adaptation, including by integrating adaptation with sustainable development and disaster risk reduction efforts. NAPs have the potential to become a key instrument to facilitate the integration of adaptation, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Given their success as planning instruments, the resources available for their support, and their iterative nature and flexible, nationally driven formats, NAPs are an excellent option to support the implementation of enhanced adaptation action. Finally, we have reached the end of our course. We hope you enjoyed it and will make use of the knowledge and skills gained from this e-learning video to help you provide climate action support in your work. If you find this course beneficial, please share it with others for those who might be interested. Thank you.